Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm one of the pediatric chief residents here at Stanford. Um, and on behalf of myself and my co-chiefs, Johnji and Aliza, and our entire uh, pediatric residency program, it is truly my great pleasure to introduce our Rudine DiCarlo speaker for this year, Dr. Perry Class. Dr. Class's name may be familiar to you for a variety of reasons. She is quite a busy lady. She is not only a practicing pediatrician at the Bellevue Hospital, but she is also a professor of pediatrics and of journalism at NYU, is the national director for the Reach Out and Read program. And as if that wasn't enough, she is also a very prolific author. There is a chance, a good chance, that you have read some of her books. Um, she has written over 10 and or seen her weekly column in the New York Times. Her writing is really a powerful tool for education, but it also has a way of touching the hearts of many in our profession. Whether by speaking deeply to the trainee experience or reflecting on how far we have come as physicians, Dr. Class's writing has served to remind us of our vocation and our purpose in medicine. Dr. Class has proven through her writing that she is an expert in building human connection. And we recently had the privilege of seeing her do this in person. We met with Dr. Class several weeks ago in anticipation of today's talk, and we were so struck by her down-to-earth nature, her intellectual curiosity, and her genuine regard for others. Somehow, she transformed a meeting with strangers into what felt like a catch-up with an old friend. Not only is that a rare gift, but it is certainly one that would have made Rudine proud. So without further ado, it is our honor to give the floor and a very hearty welcome to Dr. Perry Class. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation, this opportunity, and this honor. Um, I'm deeply aware, and especially after listening to Dr. Fisher's very moving words, that I'm here to mark the legacy of somebody who cared deeply about our field and about how we deliver care, and that this lecture and this chance to connect with you needs to be part of that legacy. And as I say, I'm honored to have the opportunity to have my words play that role. Talking about something which may sound like a topic that's going to be very sad, but which I hope will leave you feeling actually lucky, blessed, honored to be in the field that we're in and to get to do what we do when we do it. Nothing to disclose. I wanna start with a graph that the CDC put out, which shows you infant mortality, the same rate we all know, the number of children out of every thousand live births who don't make it to their first birthday. And this is a CDC graph showing the rates in the United States across most of the 20th century. And this was a graph that I became kind of obsessed with and um, was very important for me in the whole project that I'm going to be discussing with you. And what I want you to see when you, it's a very stark graph. It starts not at the very beginning of the 20th century because at the very beginning of the 20th century, we don't have those numbers. Nobody was registering all the live births, counting all of the deaths. You couldn't make that ratio. There were other ways that mortality rates were being calculated. And what I wanna emphasize and what sort of came to possess me was the idea that if you went back, not that far, a hundred years to the 1920s, which coincidentally in the 1920s, um, the teens, that's when my grandmothers are, um, running around the tenement houses of New York City, um, having their babies, that is to say my mother and my father, that if you go back to that era and you get a group of people together around a table and you go around the table, infant and child mortality is gonna have touched every person. Everyone's gonna have lost a baby, lost a sibling, lost a good friend in school. It's going to be a part of every life, whether people are very wealthy and very powerful, and I'm going to illustrate that for you, or whether people are poor, although it's always worse to be poor, disenfranchised in a community that's marginalized. But this is a part of being a parent and also a part of being a pediatrician. So there you have my two adult identities, um, what I think of as my own experiences, 
so shaped and colored by this fact. And I trained in the 1980s in pediatrics. And by the time I trained, childhood death was not supposed to happen. Pretty much every death represented some kind of failure to have adequate protections in place. If it was something we couldn't treat, we thought about it as something we can't treat yet. And I would illustrate that with this excellent manual on palliative care, end of life care for children that came out from the National Academies in 2003. And it's a, a manual of end of life care, which says on page one, that a child's death in a very real sense is unnatural. And we are all so privileged to practice at a time when we can think of childhood death as unnatural. I wanna take you back to some of what went into creating that idea. And I would also reference the CDC director who last summer testifying before Congress was asked, in, um, asked to comment on how not so many children had died as um, people in other groups from COVID and responded passionately, but children are not supposed to die. And I want to talk about what a privilege and an honor and a triumph it is to be even able to see that and say that as a goal in our field. And I just thought I would, um, by way of going back to children and the landscape of childhood death, one of the things I found when I was working on this project was if you go back to the landscape of our country or all countries, but let's start with ours, a um, hundred years ago, 150 years ago, the, the landscape is dotted with institutions which commemorate children who died. And so for example, um, the Rockefeller Institute is founded by the richest man in history, John D. Rockefeller, the first billionaire who founds the Rockefeller Institute when his beloved grandson dies of scarlet fever at the beginning of the 20th century. And he founds the Institute in part to try to solve some of the problems. But even if, you, uh, as my grandmother would have said, even if you're John D. Rockefeller, there was nothing you could do to keep that beloved baby alive. Um, so I thought given um, where, where I'm speaking that I would start with Leland Stanford Jr. Um, and reference, I've, I've given you some of the references on this. Again, a child of great wealth and privilege, um, uh, a, child, a very promising child, lots of records of his interest in science and in collecting, the only child of two parents who, especially for that time, somewhat older when he's born, um, they take him off to Europe on the grand tour. Again, everything as luxurious as it can be. And then in 1883, um, he develops us while sightseeing in Greece, develops a sore throat and a headache, sleeps unusually heavily on the train to Naples. And then in Florence, Italy, a place where I've spent a lot of time recently, he becomes more seriously ill. Here is the luxury hotel, um, still there in Florence. There's, uh, you see on the bottom there, their um, advertising language about a luxury home in the heart of Florence. Uh, historic palazzo where you can breathe all the time of the Renaissance people on the grand tour. Um, but he gets sick, he gets typhoid, the fever spikes. His mother writes, I have turned for comfort to the giver of both good and evil and my faith has increased. And now I again turn to him with entreaties to save to me my darling son. And they recount the, the treatment. Um, the Doctors wrapped his body in ice cold wet sheets. They brought in nuns around the clock to nurse him. And at one point the hotel manager had straw scattered outside to deaden street noise. And then two months before his 16th birthday, he died. This is uh, just to give you the biology because I think these stories are interesting to think about medically. He dies of typhoid fever. Um, and there's actually one of your colleagues, Dr. James Gamble, who's talked um, uh, and research the treatments which were available for typhoid fever. You all know that it's actually a bacterial illness and I've given you a little bit of the chronology of discovery of um, what causes it, whether it's bad smell, miasma, whether it's actual contamination. Um, and the idea, it's not that far away. This is happening in the 1880s, by 1906, there will be a typhoid vaccination marketed for travelers for general use in the United States. But again, this is, we are, 
the, the, this institution traces itself back to an incidence of child mortality. So again, I want to take you back behind not only this graph in the United States, but this graph, which gives you a look at global child mortality back through history, back to 1800 and before. And the truth is that through most of human history, we were a species in which if you were describing us biologically, humans, you would say, you would say that somewhere around 40%, a third, to somewhere close to a half of our offspring do not make it to the fifth birthday. Some of them die early, some die later, and even after the fifth birthday, there are dangers. And that was just a historical truth in every country and in every social group. In fact, if you go back to say the Renaissance or to Shakespeare's time, you find a genre of what were called comfort books books, the whole point of which was to tell parents how to deal with this truth, with this fact. Here's one that was published in England in 1630, A Handkerchief for Parents Upon the Death of Children, which was interesting because many of these books are written by a grieving mother to other grieving mothers. This one was by a grieving father to other grieving fathers. And you see it starts by warning you that life is perilous, that some are suffocated in the womb, that some are crushed to death in the birth that some are snatched away in the cradle, that some are mowed off in the May of youth. And here's the comfort that he has to offer you. Imagine that a great duke or prince has lent you a beautiful picture of exquisite workmanship. Okay, are you going to pout and sniff and act as if you're injured when after you've had a few years of having that dainty sweet picture, the duke or the prince redemands it from you? In other words, your child is lent to you by the deity and you may not complain when the deity retrieves that child. And if we scroll forward a couple of centuries and jump across the Atlantic, here's a, what was a very, very famous poem by the American poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And he wrote it after the death of his very young daughter. And here's where I took the title for this talk. There is no flock, however watched and tended, but one dead lamb is there. There is no fireside, howsoe'er defended, but has one vacant chair. Now, both Longfellow and his wife missed their daughter desperately, wrote about missing her, but what he had to offer, it's the title of the poem, is resignation, because that one vacant chair is going to be at every fireside. Last example, um, Charles Dickens, who had 10 children with his wife, the baby who was Nedora, named for one of the characters in one of his books, suddenly developed convulsions and died. And Dickens' wife was out of town getting medical treatment herself, and he decided to break the news to her slowly. He wrote to her that little Dora is suddenly stricken ill. I will not deceive you. I think her very ill. Actually, little Dora had died. He's trying to prepare his wife. But look what he says. Remember what I have often told you, that we never can expect to be exempt as to our many children from the afflictions of other parents. It's part of being a parent. Certainly, it's part of being a caregiver. And in along the themes of compassionate care, what I want to keep returning to in this talk is what that meant, what it had to mean in an era when children were as likely to die as they were, and both how that informed the care and the caregivers and how proud we should be, if you ask me, of what may be our greatest human achievement, which is to get not all the way, but to get such a long part of the way to where we can say children should not die there is something beyond resignation, and it is part of our privilege to be part of what is not resignation, what is actually helping to take care of children and keep them here so that they live to grow up. Now, I'm going to talk about inequities and disparities, but before I talk about inequities and disparities, let me show you what we might call a convenient sample of rich, powerful white men. Here are the first uh, 100 years of United States presidents. And I went back and looked to see what happened. And 
100% of them who had biological children lost at least one biological child. And I think you can take this, as I say, for a convenient sample of people who got state-of-the-art medical care, who had every possible privilege and every possible um, attention paid. And what you will see is that every one of them who had children and some who had adoptive children and stepchildren lost at least one child. This was part of every life, including the lives of the privileged and the powerful. Um, and I would, we're going, one of the themes we're going to return to a little um, is um, the terror of what happens with dysentery and diarrhea. Here's John Quincy Adams, who is the son of one president and will go on to be president himself. But this is when he is the ambassador to Russia, writing to his mother, Abigail Adams in 1812 about the death of our dear and only daughter as lovely and promising a child as ever was taken from the full hopes of the fondest parent. And he goes on to say she had been much healthier and he's, she already had six teeth, but she's teething and she's weaned. And after um, the appearance of her illness, that violent dysentery, they try starting nursing again, but there's a fever, there's convulsions and she dies. And there's nothing that anyone can do about that. I'll remind you what some of the statistics are that we're talking about, the infant mortality rate, um, out of a thousand live births, the deaths by one, the under five mortality rate by five. And I'll just show you some numbers. And these are numbers which should make you simultaneously sad and proud because the global under five mortality rate in 2019, and we don't know yet exactly all of the dangers that the pandemic may pose. In 2019, it was 38 out of a thousand live births, deaths by five. That had dropped from 93 out of 1,000 in 1990. And if you look at the breakdown, what you'll see is that globally of the children who are dying before the age of five, almost half are dying in the first month of life, neonatal mortality, and many more of the rest in the first year of life. And that in the United States, where the under five mortality rate in 2018 was just under seven, 6.89, you see the same pattern that the neonatal mortality is a very large piece of it in that first month and the infant mortality in the first year and another big piece of what we're looking at. I'm gonna show you a, a couple of historical slides just to give you a sense of how this works. If we go all the way back to 1800, infant and child mortality, this is death by the age of five, um, it's high everywhere you go. The whole world, as I showed you in that other graph, is subject to these rates. If we go forward to 1950, uh, a little before I was born, what you suddenly see is the appearance of tremendous inequity and disparity because there are parts of the world where the mortality rates have gone all the way down to three, 3%, three 4%, 5%, while there are still parts of the world where you have mortality rates 40% and higher, 30% and higher. And then if you jump forward again to 2015, here's what you see. Still disparities in equities, but you do see progress overall. The parts of the world that have driven down the rate have driven it down even further to rates so low that they would probably have been completely unthinkable 100 years earlier. And other parts of the world, although there are still parts with much higher child mortality rates, you don't see any of those 30, 40, even 20% rates that you saw earlier. So there has been change. And again, I come back to this graph that made such an impression on me of what was happening in the United States over the 20th century. Here's the child mortality rate under five in the United States over the second half of the 20th century. And again, this is something where I think about situating my own training in pediatrics and what has happened since then um, in the 1980s. And again, think about how dramatically different our job has become than the job of our teachers who perhaps trained in the 60s and 70s, people who were my teachers. 
Now, one thing that I want to say, and I know everyone here knows it, is that it wouldn't be right to just talk of one infant mortality rate in the United States as if it were the same everywhere. We know that there are dramatic disparities in the infant mortality rate and in the child mortality rate and in the maternal mortality rates in this country. We know that the rates in the black community are twice as high as in the white community. And we know that if you break it down again by infant neonatal, that you see patterns which make it clear that this is a multifactorial inequity, which has to be addressed from the point of view of care, but also from the point of view of other systemic inequities and barriers which are preventing some populations from being able to save as many of their children as other parts of the population. Um, I would want to point out that these inequities have persisted, they're not new that when the infant and child mortality rates were unthinkably high, they were also double in the black population what they were in the white population. And there's, um, there are historians who have carefully retrieved data from different parts of the country comparing urban and rural, black and white. And what we can see is that again, although infant mortality has come down extremely dramatically in all the populations, the inequity, the ratio, the comparative, um, the disparity and the comparative twice as high infant mortality rate has persisted or in some cases, even the inequity has even gotten worse, even while more and more of the babies were surviving. All of this, I would comment, um, has we should think about because we think about infant mortality and child mortality now on a global level as an index to how societies are doing, to how well they are managing to take care of their, their youngest citizens. I want to talk a little bit about some of what went in to the drop and the decrease, but also a little bit about some of the caregivers and the influence of having um, caregivers from different backgrounds of all of what you heard about when we talked about Dr. DiCarlo at the beginning of touching and sitting down and listening. I want to try to bring you into a sense of how that played out in certain specific topics. I'm going to start with a disease that I've never seen, and I suspect many of us have never seen. Um, and not only have I never seen it, I've actually never in all my training and practice, never had to lie awake at night worrying that maybe that was diphtheria and I missed it. So I want to talk a little bit about a disease that I've never seen. It's a bacterial disease. It's a toxin-mediated disease. The bacteria produces a toxin which attacks tissues and debris and necrotic tissue build up in the throat, creating a thick leathery pseudomembrane although the toxins can also attack the heart, the kidney, the nervous system. It was a relatively common disease and not surprisingly, uh, since it's a disease which kills in many cases by obstructing the airway, it was most serious in the youngest children with the smallest airways. The first case of, that I wanna talk about is uh, Dr. Abraham Jacoby, who if you look him up on, oh, I don't know, Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia, you'll find that he's uh, you know, regarded as the father or the founder of American pediatrics. He's the person who actually wrote, you know how we hear over and over again that children are not small adults. He's the one who actually wrote writing about pharmacology. Pediatrics does not deal with miniature men and women. He was a strong proponent of the idea that children had their own biology. He had an interesting life. He was born in Germany. The report um, is that he was weak and sickly as a small child. And he always, all his life had a certain sympathy for those who didn't um, start out obviously big and strong. While he was a medical student, he also got involved in revolutionary politics, got his MD and was immediately sent to prison. But, um, and would we be this resourceful? He escaped in 1853 and went to England hoping to join up with Marx and Engels. And um, they, they found him a little um, wild and suggested he try his luck in the United States where he indeed prospered. He became the first professor of pediatrics, which was a term that he liked. 
um, and also founded the first free children's clinic. Um, he was revolutionarily minded all his life. He thought a lot about the social context of pediatrics. Um, and if our field has braided into it from the beginning, some sense of social pediatrics and social determinants of health, he probably gets some of the credit. Let me tell you about his history um, as a parent. He married Fanny Jacoby. They had a son who died at one age of what his father diagnosed as a meningitis. Fanny then died in 1856, probably from pregnancy complications. He married again. With his second wife, there were two stillbirths and two babies who died soon after birth. Again, he signed those death certificates and he diagnosed both of those babies with weakness or debility. And then Kate died, probably from the complications of a miscarriage. In 1873, he married for the third time. Mary Putnam Jacoby um, was a physician. She got her MD in 1864 from the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania, but she wanted to study more than that. She was the first woman allowed to study medicine at the Sorbonne in Paris, and they made her use a separate entrance so she wouldn't contaminate the male students. Um, she did brilliantly in Paris. In 1871, she came back to New York and was elected to membership in the Medical Society of the County of New York. Dr. Jacoby, who was the president of the society, spoke at that meeting and pointed out that that society, we have opened our doors to worthy members of the medical profession, male or female, white or colored, and thus granted reality to the gospel of American citizenship, the Declaration of Independence. Um, and this is worth pointing out because many medical societies not only were not admitting women or African-Americans, but would go on not admitting them for some time to come. Um, these two doctors got married. And I just wanna emphasize that bet the, between their knowledge of pediatric medicine, women's health, there was a tremendous amount of expertise in this marriage. Um, this is in some ways for me a parallel to talking about the presidents, that is to say, being wealthy and powerful did not protect you. Knowing more than anybody else about disease and therapeutics did not protect you. They had a daughter who died at one day of age of what her father diagnosed as, as atelectus pulmonum from intrauterine respiration, probably meconium. And Mary Putnam Jacoby wrote to her brother, I always felt that my first baby would not live. They had a son in 1875, Ernst, and Mary wrote to her mother about her husband. The doctor's happiness in the baby is so intense as to be touching and almost awful. And then they had a daughter, Marjorie, in 1878. Now, Abraham Jacoby knew more than anyone in the world on, about diphtheria. He published a treatise on it in 1880, which is encyclopedic and fascinating, and the saddest paragraph in it is this one in which he writes about tracheotomy, about doing emergency last ditch tracheotomies to try to save babies, who, who uh, children who can't breathe. And he writes honestly about how bad his results are, about how the percentage of recoveries is so low, he writes, that only the utter impossibility of witnessing a child's dying from asphyxia has goaded me on to the performance of tracheotomy. And so there you have someone who's often spoken of as the founder of our field in America, admitting to you that the, the, the desperation, um, the futility and trying to decide what is the right kind of care in a situation in which there is honestly so little that he can do. In 1883, three years after he published that treatise, both Jacoby children got diphtheria. Ernst died at the age of seven years, 10 months and seven days. Marjorie survived. Um, neither of his parents, of course, ever got over it. Um, and in 1884, a year later, um, Abraham Jacoby published a case study about his own family in which he concluded that the problem was that the old trusted and trustworthy nurse had also been um, chronically infected with diphtheria. And scholars have speculated about whether 
part of what may have been driving him may have been a uh, terrible nagging anxiety that perhaps um, as a clinician, there, he, there might have been another way that the infection could have come home into his own family and that he needed to find another reason. The second case that I wanna talk about about diphtheria is the family of W.E.B. Du Bois, the sociologist, historian, civil rights activist who wrote about the birth of his first son, Burghardt, in his 1903 masterpiece, The Souls of Black Folk, about watching the child grow and seeing in him the dream of his own Black fathers move forward in the world. Here's W.E.B. Du Bois with Nina Du Bois, his wife, and Burghardt, the baby. And when this story takes place, he had moved the family to Atlanta. He had accepted a professorship there in 1899. And in 18 months, the child came down with diphtheria. And there's a, a heartbreaking essay in the book of the passing of the firstborn in which the child, um, the little feet pattered wearily to the wee white bed, the tiny hands trembled. There was no white doctor in Atlanta who was willing to treat him. Du Bois tried to connect with one of the few black doctors. The baby was sick for 10 days and then died. And they decided they did not want to bury him there in Georgia and took him back to Massachusetts to bury him. This has actually occasioned some historical scholarship trying to figure out whether in fact there was a treatment available in Atlanta at the time. There was one doctor who had ordered some anti-serum, which I'm about to talk about, but it's not clear how it was used, whether any remained or who got it. This is an example reaching back to the 19th century about geography also as destiny because Burkhardt's mother believed always that it was because they had left Philadelphia, that if they had been in the right city, there would have been a treatment. And she was correct. Because diphtheria antitoxin is a story that is happening at the same time as these other stories. 1883, the year that the Jacoby children get sick, is also the year that the bacteria is identified. Five years later, the toxin is identified as the culprit. And by 1890, um, two researchers, von Bering, who's German, and Kitasato, who's Japanese, working together, have figured out how to immunize animals and get anti-serum. And then Rue and Martin just find out a way to do that in horses, which are much bigger and produce much more serum. So in 1894, they do a study. They give the antitoxin. And look at how many children they've got to work with. They give antitoxin to 448 children with diphtheria who are hospitalized at one hospital and more than three quarters recover. And at the hospital where they don't use it, more than half die. And listen to the words from when this is presented in 1894. Hats were thrown to the ceiling, grave scientific men arose to their feet and shouted their applause in all the languages of the civilized world. I had never seen and have never seen since such an ovation displayed by an audience of scientific men. They have something, this new science of bacteriology, it's given them a weapon. It's given them something they can do when they're in the position that Abraham Jacoby was writing about, watching a child die of, by asphyxia. They've got a weapon, they've got, and um, Dr. Howard Markell has written about the hero horses in New York City, the reason that your city matters so much is that in, say, in New York, the public health department has decided to buy horses and they put them in a luxurious stable. They've got names and the public is reading about them in the newspaper. They're the hero horses. They're producing antitoxin, antiserum, and it's in the public health department domain and it's available to everyone. So it's very much city by city by city. Um, the other thing that's happening right around the same time is they're figuring out how you might be able to intubate um, a child who needs a breathing tube. And this is an instructional um, painting of the time. And the scientific developments happen quickly. The, the, the horse serum causes a lot of reactions. They identify serum sickness. They develop an immunity test. So Anti-serum is not completely satisfactory. It's hard to titrate. It doesn't deliver the lasting immunity. It doesn't always work. So by 1913, they've mixed toxin and antitoxin. 
and develop the vaccine. And by 1921, right, this is more than 30 years before the polio campaign, there are vaccination campaigns. They take 180,000 school children in New York, test 90,000 and the ones who are um, not immune or vaccinated and they leave 90,000 who are not tested or vaccinated and they see four times as many cases of diphtheria. So you've got, this should look familiar. You've got vaccination campaigns in New York in the 20s. Every child with a little card, here are the school nurses delivering the vaccines and you can see every child holding a card um, and diphtheria starts to go away. The most famous story I just have to mention about the battle against diphtheria, of course, is the story of the heroic um, journey of the sled dog teams across Alaska because in 1925 in Nome, Alaska, diphtheria breaks out and the doctor has ordered antitoxin, but it hasn't arrived and the port has iced in for the winter. And the doctor is especially aware that in the indigenous families, there's no immunity and diphtheria tends to be fatal. When the children start dying in January, they send the antitoxin from Anchorage to Nanana and the teams of sled dogs and their mushers carry it over the last 674 miles over the Iditarod Trail where the race is now run. And the statue of Balto on the left in Central Park is probably the most beloved memento of the battle against diphtheria. But I need to say that um, Togo, who was the lead dog on the longest and most difficult part, who you see on the right with his team, is also someone that um, many people feel deserves more attention. I'm going to finish this section again, coming back to the idea of the caregivers and what this meant and what it was like to practice and what privilege we now enjoy with an account from the Canadian Public Health Journal in 1927, um, in which a doctor recalls watching a, a beautiful girl of five or six years, the fourth child in a farmer's family to become the victim of diphtheria who choked to death. Um, I felt as did every physician of that day as if my hands were literally tied. And then he writes about his own daughter becoming ill with diphtheria and um, he was able to give the antitoxin and to watch the choking dreadful membrane melt away and disappear in a few hours with complete restoration to health within a few days was one of the most dramatic and thrilling experiences of my professional career. So again, a little piece of what is disappearing or what is dropping across the century. I would say a word about TB and a uh, wonderful Dr. Edith Lincoln who started the Children's Chest Clinic at Bellevue where I work. And she starts studying the course of TB in children, but in 1922, she has nothing to offer. And I'm giving you a sense of some of what she's seeing um, in terms of mortality rates, especially in the youngest and especially in those who have either TB meningitis or miliary disease. There she is sitting on one of the old Bellevue ambulances. Um, there's uh, the treatment for adults up on the roof of the hospital getting some fresh air. Um, she starts publishing on the course and prognosis of tuberculosis in children. She has no therapy. And then in 1943, there's streptomycin, then there's isoniazide, and they're starting that they, they start treating children in the clinic in 1944. And she gets to write about this change. The survival rates for children, even with miliary TB, increased to 96%. She can even treat the children with tuberculous meningitis. And behind these sort of um, measured, calm, scientific papers, you can see the sort of the the remarkable change that she's witnessed in her clinic, practicing among especially children from the poor neighborhoods of New York. Um, she has a long career and she goes on warning. One of the things which you learn again and again in this story is that it's not, you, you don't, you can't ever create barriers. If you're going to keep children safe from tuberculosis, you have to treat the community, you have to treat the country, you have to treat the world. Last disease that I want to talk about briefly um, is uh, cholera infantum infant diarrhea, which I already referenced with the death of the Adams baby. It was a scourge. It killed so many babies, so many children, especially at weaning, especially in the summer. And nobody knew what caused it through most of history. 
Um, here's a pediatric text, which you'll notice uh, handily blames the victims. Um, this is the theory of miasma. It's bad smell, noxious vapors, um, an atmosphere rendered impure by overcrowding, personal and domiciliary uncleanliness, more common in tenement houses. I'm not even sure that was true. You could see it more clearly where people were crowded together, but this was a disease which struck in all houses. Um, I want to introduce you to one more heroine, Dr. Rebecca Crumpler, um, who was born in 1831, um, worked as a nurse with doctors in Charlestown, Massachusetts. She's the first African-American woman to get a medical degree in the United States. The doctors she worked with recommend her to the New England Female Medical College, where she faces a great deal of prejudice, but is able to graduate on schedule in four years as doctress in medicine from the New England Female Medical College. Um, and she publishes a wonderful book, um, a book of medical discourses in two parts and dedicates it to mothers, nurses, and all who may desire to mitigate the afflictions of the human race. So I'm gonna come back to her because when we think about compassionate care, when we think about caregivers who can see their patients, she has an extraordinary career. I wish I could show you her picture, but if anybody shows you her picture, don't believe it. These are all random pictures people choose. We have no photograph of her. That's why I show you the photograph of the title page of her book, and I want you to hear her voice. Um, at the time she graduated, here are the numbers um, for physicians in the United States. She has an extraordinary career because after the Civil War, she has the chance to go to Virginia, practice in a large, recently enslaved population, and then she comes back to Boston and practices out of her home on Beacon Hill, as she says in her book, receiving children in the house for treatment, regardless in a measure of remuneration, um, and this is the plaque on her, on her house on Beacon Hill, which is around the corner from the African Meeting House. Um, very strong emphasis on breastfeeding, worries about what happens to um, when people hire wet nurses, actually worries about what happens to the babies of those nurses. Again, this is 1883. This is the same year that Dr. Jacoby's children are getting sick. Um, Dr. Crumpler is writing these, worrying about these same issues. And I just want to show you what she says in her chapter on the general treatment of, of infants. Children are given to parents only for a lifetime. It may be long or it may be very short. Anyway, here's what she says about infant diarrhea. And you can again hear her, her wit and her voice. She says that it's been argued authoritatively, no doubt, that the causes of cholera infantum, and I wanna point out that cholera infantum, which means summer diarrhea, is not cholera. It's just the name for summer diarrhea. Um, that the causes are poor milk, bad air arising from old water soaked cellars of tenement houses, or when it affects those of all conditions in life, the rich, the poor, the black, and the white, then its cause is said to be in some atmospherical phenomena. The other thing that's happening right around then is a real awareness of poverty. It's the publication of How the Other Half Lives. It's a new, a time with that we're moving toward when infant mortality is gonna be recognized as a social problem, which requires social answers. It's a time when um, this um, doctor, Dr. Josephine Baker is going to be the first director of the New York City Bureau of Child Hygiene, which is the first such bureau in the United States. And you see, she's again, um, referencing those summer dysentery epidemics and how terrible they were. And she does an experiment in which she uses the school nurses to visit families in one set of tenements to again talk breastfeeding, ventilation, and there's a significant reduction in the deaths in that area, 1,200 fewer deaths. I had learned one thing, she writes, heat did not necessarily kill babies. These are her, her troops, the visiting nurses at the Henry Street Settlement in New York. Um, these are the nurses from the Lincoln School for Nurses founded in 1898 in the Bronx um, because many nursing schools did not admit black women um, and um, continued to train nurses till 1961. Here's a later graduating class. And this is Elizabeth Tyler, one of those wonderful heroic nurses from that school who um, not only did health, but did education 
Here she is in Philadelphia with a group of children at a so-called little mother's club, teaching with a doll, teaching children how to care for their younger siblings safely. Um, another one of those nurses, Jessie Sleet Scales, I just again want you to hear her words um, in describing her work in New York City. And again, coming back to the topic of compassionate care, I visited 41 families, made 156 calls, nine cases of consumption. You can read everything she did and come back to that question of giving good care. I've given baths, applied poultices, dressed wounds, washed and dressed newborn babies, cared for mothers, and there she is. So I'm going to end with the words of Dr. Crumpler from a book of medical discourses. It is just as important that a doctor should be in attendance before the birth of a poor woman's child as that he should be present before the birth of a child of wealth. And it should be considered inhuman in any physician to purposely absent him or herself. Um, and I think I'm actually going to stop there and see if people have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Glass. This is a beautiful illustration of really just how far we've come. And it's at once sobering and inspiring. I, I completely agree with how you introduced that. And you know, I think Susan in our Q&A here has very um, aptly summed it up and saying these are excellent case examples of how much has been accomplished and how much more is needed to be done. And then she followed that up by saying, I want to help. And I think that'd be a great uh, way to open up the Q&A of, what do you see as the the next scourge? You know, we talk about diarrheal disease, you talk about tuberculosis and diphtheria, and I have the fortune of having seen very little, if any, of uh, those, of, of children really succumbing to those, but what is the next mountain that we've yet to climb or even maybe start climbing in pediatrics that you've seen? Well, I think one of the things that we've learned um, in the past decades and that we've watched our field pediatrics respond to is a little bit, if we are not, as pediatricians, especially in primary care, if we're not terrified of the summer diarrhea or the diphtheria or the complications of measles, if those push to the side, then we have, we have a little space to ask parents, so what are you worried about? And I think that a lot of the changes in the, the new focuses that we've seen in pediatrics from beginning to pay attention to the effects of poverty on child development, um, the effects of racism on child health and development, but in general, starting to think about brain development, about supporting parents, about early relational health, that is in some ways part of the privilege of what we can do when we're no longer worried about these diseases, when every fever, and I didn't even talk about scarlet fever, but when every fever and sore throat doesn't have to make parents think, have to make providers think, oh no, is this going to be one of the bad ones? So I think that, that whole, our whole broadening of the field that we've all seen, and I, I see reach out and read and, and you know early literacy as part of this, to think about development, to think about brain development, to think about parenting, to think about supporting families and, and um, you know, infant mental health. And all of that is partly what we've won by being able to prevent so many of these deaths. Thank you. Uh, another thing, I, this is so much a story of really brave doctors. And I, I think Josephine Baker, there's an excerpt that you have of her actually punching a, a uh, abusive husband so that she can care to the children and the delivering child uh, and take care of uh, them. And I'm curious where you think that we as pediatricians now, you know, need to be more brave and what you're telling your students and your trainees as they come into speak up and be brave. And who are the doctors who are doing that now that are inspiring you? What a good question, although I'd almost rather crowdsource the answer and you know, find out who, who are the people who are inspiring the doctors in training. I think there's a lot of it. I think that, I think that we can, it, when I say be proud, I don't mean we, that we can sit back and relax and say it's all done. But I think that the voices coming out of pediatrics, both in reckoning um, honestly with things which have been wrong in the past and with advocating as loudly as we can for children at a moment when quite honestly, many of us feel children have not been the first priority over the last couple of years. Um, I, I 
think we've been uh, a, a pretty honorable profession. I just looked at um, the people from um, Stanford who are going to be speaking at and going to be honored at PAS. And I thought, oh, those are people I've, I've called over the last couple of years when I needed um, wisdom on um, immunizations, when I needed wisdom on health equity. I think that, you know, again, I think, I think without ever saying that the job is done or that there's enough, I think we are in a field which actually does have a, a history of reckoning with um, the social context of children's lives and with the fact that you, so the biggest message that I learned from doing this, and I referenced this in the talk, is you don't make children safe by building a moat around your house and saying, okay, in my house, we're safe. That doesn't work. It doesn't keep children safe. And anyway, children have to go out eventually. You make children safe by making the community safe, by making the country safe, by making the world safe for children. And that I think we understand that collectively. Thank you. And I want to be cognizant of our time. It's just clicked over to 9 AM. And uh, I think that this talk is very much in, in uh, the spirit of Rudine DiCarlo makes me proud to be a pediatrician. So I want to thank you, Dr. Class. I want to thank you, Dr. Fisher, for your beautiful remarks. And most importantly, I want to thank Dr. DiCarlo for this lectureship, for all that she did as a pediatrician, and the impact that she continues to have on our community. Thank you, everybody. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.